Please welcome everyone. I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to the session organized by the Norwegian part of the alumni network uh, at Neoma Alumni. Um, today we'll be talking about um, uh, lifelong learning and how can open flexible solution enable lifelong learning opportunities for all. So I'm very happy to welcome you today. I will be sharing my screen with uh, just a few um, facts about the Norwegian network and the alumni, NOMA alumni network in general, introduce you uh, the, the speakers today that uh, are participating in, in this session. And, uh, and leave the floor to, to, to them so that they can present you the, the, their, their presentation. So I will just share my screen here if you see it. Um, there. So um, let's see. Do you see anything? There. Welcome again. Um, I'm uh, Anais uh, rod malbran I um, coordinate the Norwegian part of the alumni network of um, Neoma Alumni. Uh, we've organized this session today of the Rentrée des Tribus, which is um, the annual event that um, the Neoma Alumni organizes for the whole uh, global network. And uh, this year, um, we are very happy to welcome uh, ICDE and the uh, BI uh, Norwegian Business School in the in the meeting, um, I just wanted to give you a few words about the, the alumni network um, for those of you who doesn't, don't know it yet, because uh, it's um, uh, an event open to, to everyone. I don't know, I know that not all the, the alumni are so much in connection with the, with the events that are organized. So it's a, a global network that has uh, more than 65,000 uh, former students, um, and um, we are um, represented in the, every region of the world and also uh, in every sector. Um, I was participating um, in the opening session uh, and they were mentioning that whenever you are confronted to the business, uh, you meet some of the alumni network people uh, in France at least and sometimes uh, in other regions of the world. So it's a very uh, vivid network. And uh, in Norway, we are um, a few <laughs> of them. So uh, uh, around um, 60 members uh, to the date. Uh, we uh, try to be connected with other members uh, in the region, in the Scandinavia region. We have organized, uh, for instance, events with the Swedish uh, network. And um, you're very welcome to look at what we're doing. We try to support the alumni um, when they need. For instance, during the pandemic, I've been helping to map the students that uh, are among other uh, uh, universities in BI Business School with the exchange uh, partnerships that we have with the Norwegian Business School and to help them um, just with the technicalities of uh, going back to France. So we help the students and the members of the network as much as we can organize events, sometimes formal, sometimes informal. Today is a formal event where we will discuss the uh, topic that I think is very relevant and I hope you will enjoy. Um, we will have um, the red thread uh, of this uh, Rentre des Tribus this year is the project that's engaged for positive impact, which is the background of the discussion today. It's a project that's organized by the headquarters of the network and that um, try to connect the alumni network to be engaged in um, the questioning to, to uh, environmental and societal challenges. And, and there is a manifesto that you can sign. There is a, a way to, to be mobilized through the network and to um, uh, participate in either those who are already working in the topic or uh, just be informed and, and understand what the network is doing um, in that uh, uh, project. So every event of the, the week that uh, will be the Rentrée des Tribus, which is from today, is the first day until the end of the week. There is more than 50 events that are organized uh, around the world. There will be two plenary sessions. So one was uh, today for the opening session. There'll be a closing session also at the end of the week. 
and uh, you're very welcome to participate in everything. And today, so you're very welcome in the Norwegian session. And we will um, discuss the topic of lifelong learning with the, the Secretary General of uh, the International Council for Open and Distance Education, Torin Jalsvik, who is also very linked to the France because um, she's uh, studied uh, French, um, French uh, um, uh, literature and also has been uh, through the network uh, uh, connected to the CNED, the, the um, uh, French uh, Distance uh, Center uh, for Education. And uh, she will be presenting um, uh, initiative of ICD uh, in lifelong learning and uh, open education. So um, you'll be able to understand better what concepts uh, are and uh, how it's important for um, education for all. And uh, then um, Jens Chetil Arnulf, the Dean of Executive, of Executive Program at BI Business School, will uh, present um, opportunities for flag learning from a business perspective. So please, Torin, the floor is yours. And uh, I will stop sharing so that you can share your screen. Thank you very much, uh, Nais, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, together with you, um, together with my colleague Anais uh, from ICD and also my former colleague Jan Chetil Arnold from BI Business School, where I uh, worked for almost 11 years with um, online education programs and the uh, start of the e-learning center, which now is called the, the BI Learning Lab. So, a uh, pleasure to be here. I am today. I will speak about ICDE. Uh, that's the International Council for Open and Distance Education, and uh, I will briefly introduce um, the organization to you. So, um, it was. It, it's a very old organization. We are the oldest membership organization for uh, distance uh, and online education, founded back in Canada in 1938. And we are a global, not-for-profit, non-governmental organization. And we are hosted and partly funded by Norway since 1988. So this is why the Secretariat of ICVE is uh, based in uh, Oslo, Norway. And we are in a formal consultative partnership with UNESCO that's also been taking place since the, well, since the late 1960s. So a long, a long history there, uh, but the purpose of what we're doing is the same um, as it was back in 1938. It's to foster inclusive education through the learning met methodologies that exists. So it started with correspondence education back in 1938 through postal letters. Uh, and uh, along the historical line, education um, technology obviously changed. Uh, so we have been doing broadcasting, television, radio, uh, different types of communication through um, video cassettes or DVDs or CD-ROMs and whatnot. And now um, a lot of the uh, education takes place, of course, through the internet or mobile phones. Uh, but distance education is still uh, very much alive in many parts of the world where connectivity still is uh, a major um, concern. So um, very briefly about our organization, we have a, a bit more than 330 members and partners um, in over 70 countries in the world. You can see them on the map here. And uh, the members are mainly um, educational institutions, so higher education institutions, but also technical and vocational institutions. But we also have individual members, uh, which are faculty experts and also student members. So we have a free student membership for um, PhD and master students who are doing um, the research uh, in open distance flexible learning. So why should we talk about lifelong learning? Well, obviously, because it's... Uh, written in the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a part of the Education Sustainable Development Goal 4 uh, on education. Um, but also, uh, and this is because uh, there are a major mega trends that affects uh, the way we need to develop ourselves and educate ourselves and learn throughout lives. 
globalization and digitalization are major trends. Um, in addition, uh, automation, um, and we have the climate change, which also forces the industry to change in a more green direction. It means that some jobs will become obsolete, but very quickly also new jobs develop. And we see that both the public and private sector um, is they're demanding, there's an increased demand for new skills, new competencies. So we all need to learn throughout life. And we need to do it while we're working, while we're having kids, families, and doing everything else that we're doing in our life. And this is why our Prime Minister, Erna Solberg, said in her keynote at the ICD Lillehammer Lifelong Learning Summit two years ago, we have to stop thinking about education the same way we think about learning to ride a bike, that we only have to do it once. We need to continue to learn. So this is why we're talking about lifelong learning. A part of lifelong learning is also open education resources and open education. And I will um, spend some minutes with you now to explain the implications of what we are in open education resources, because my experience is that many are not very familiar with it. If you are very familiar with the OER, bear with me. I hope it's still useful. Um, uh, but I'll come to the point why it's uh, very uh, important for lifelong learning. So open education resources, you can see the definition um, here by UNESCO. It's learning, teaching and research materials in any format. So it could be printed or virtual uh, that resides in the public domain or are under a, an, a license, an open license that have been released under an open license that permits you to do something with it, share it reuse it, uh, distribute it, adapt it. And what does this mean? Uh, so it's very important to uh, differentiate between the intellectual property rights and the permission rights. An open license refers to a license that respects the intellectual property rights of the copyright owner. But in addition, it provides permission, granting access um, to access, reuse, repurpose, adapt and redistribute educational materials. And open education resources is a key to sustainable development goal four. And here you see the framework for action for the education 2030. And you see it's written here, um, a well-established properly regulated tertiary education system supported by technology, open education resources and distance education modalities can increase access, equity, quality, and relevance, and narrow the gap between what is taught at tertiary education institutions and what economies and societies demand. Because we see that the demand for new skills and competencies that come from the working community, from the public and private sector, sometimes they feel that the educators cannot cope with this demand because education is slow and it takes time to develop these programs. So it's stated here, it's also stated by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, that OER can be a tool for innovation in teaching and learning, a catalyst for innovation, they called it. And this is because of all the permission rights with everything you can do with open educational resources. There's a big potential with these resources because the access will be increased for everyone to these resources. It's cost saving for the users. It's an alternative to expensive te textbooks and resources behind paywalls. And uh, educators can adapt and reuse these resources. Uh, for example, translate them to other languages, uh, adapt them to learners with special needs or do other types of local adaptation. And everyone, also the students can contribute to updating, develop and refine these resources. So there's the innovation aspect. And in order to understand um, the different permission rights, I find this um, illustration helpful, the five R's of OER, which are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. It means that you can make and, and own the copies. You can use them in many uh, different ways, adapt them, modify them, and improve them, combine them maybe in new ways, and redistribute and share with others. 
Perhaps you're familiar with the Creative Commons licenses. Many are, um, but maybe you didn't know that the Creative Commons licenses come in different categories with different permission sets. So starting with the on the top, um, the CC BY license is the most open of all licenses. If I um, grant a resource with this, this uh, license, um, I, I uh, give everyone the right to copy, publish, um, use uh, the resource for commercial purpose, modify and adapt, or even change the license. But the attribution is required. It means that if there's something with my name on it because I made it, still need to attribute uh, and credit uh, me as an author. So it respects the intellectual property right, but it adds a specific permission to it. And the other uh, licenses that you can see further down have different kinds of permissions and restrictions. So if I, for example, choose to label a resource with CC by non-derivation, it means that anyone can share and reuse it but they cannot modify and adapt the resource itself. Um, and if you use the non-commercial uh, license, everything is uh, possible except use the resource for commercial purpose. So one can have different reasons for giving different sets of permissions. And these Creative Commons licenses give you the opportunity to differentiate um, the resources that you, you want to um, uh, to label uh, or the different sets of permissions that you want to give. There's also a political instrument um, that is very important for the work with OER that really um, it was really a milestone in, in 2019 with the UNESCO recommendation on OER. This is the, the only existing international standard setting instruments uh, that, that exist in the field of technology and education. It was adopted anonymously by all the UNESCO member states in November uh, 2019 at, at the UNESCO um, Annual General Conference. And it supports um, all this that I've been talking about now for five minutes, the creation, use and adaptation of OER. And it also facilitates international cooperation in this field. So obviously ICDE as a consultative partner to UNESCO is very committed to the recommendation on OER. And the implementation of the recommendation contributes not only to the Sustainable Development Goal 4, as I mentioned before, but also at least six other Sustainable Development Goals, such as uh, number five, which is about gender equality, number nine, which is about industry innovation and infrastructure, number 10, which is about reducing inequalities within and across countries, and 16 about peace, justice, and strong institutions. And finally, 17, which is about the partnerships for the goals. And this recommendation, it's not only a paper that the member states sign, but it also sets out some action areas. So here we can see what it's about. So building capacity is one action area, developing supportive policies, and ensure access to quality OER to develop those and share those, and the sustainability models. And finally, the fifth action area, which is about facilitating international collaboration. And for this purpose, um, UNESCO established something that they call the Dynamic Coalition, where ICD is a partner. And I have many details on this slide that I don't have the time to go through, but if we share the, the slides later, you can check them out if you're interested. But it's very much about leveraging on the networks that exist, um, facilitate uh, regional collaboration and uh, intergovernmental co uh, collaboration and um, establish and identify partnerships. So when ICD is working with OER, it's because of all these backgrounds and uh, this political instrument that exists and all the potential um, and benefits coming from open education resources. So we are a partner of the OER Dynamic Coalition. Uh, we have um, our own advocacy committee for OER, and those are experts appointed among ICD members in all world regions, and they are advocating for OER like I'm doing now in a way, but they're doing more sophisticately and with all their expertise. Um, they're working together on this advocacy task under the ICD umbrella. 
In addition to that, we have two concrete projects currently going on. One is what we call the ICD Francophone OER project, and the other is Encore Plus, which is a European network. And I'll briefly go through those as well. This Francophone expert group, um, it's a collaboration between UNESCO, ICDE, and Université Numérique, the digital university in France. And it was established also together with the French Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation uh, a couple of years ago. We have established this partnership with uh, virtual universities of three uh, Francophone African countries at the beginning, Senegal, Mali and Republic of Cong Congo. We're collaborating with UNESCO, as I said, and the French National Commission for UNESCO. And now oh, we are also working towards more countries in this region. Uh, through the virtual universities in several of the countries that you see on the slide there, and uh, also this uh, the um, organization that's named uh, an International Organization of um, La Francophonie. And um, we also approaching the ministries of these countries and business partners, because this is a, a multi-stakeholder um, project. Um, with OER, it's very important to uh, engage both public and private sector. So through this project, we're approaching both the um, academic uh, level and the, and the policy level through the ministries. And what we have been doing is to look at, we are focusing on the, the, the action areas of the UNESCO recommendation number one and two. So it's capacity building and it's supportive policies. So we have been doing a mapping in the Francophone region what do they need in terms of capacity building? What materials exist? Uh, which policies exist in the, in the region? Uh, and map out the needs identification and then started working on synergies of, of what already exists of initiatives and resources. And more concretely, we have been working with um, uh, a course um, that exists in English and it's about um, Copyright and open licensing. It's called um, Copyright and Open Licensing in a Digital Age, LIDA. And this is, of course, an open, like an OER course on OER, um, a free access for everyone. It's existed for several years in English and it's been it's developed in New Zealand. So very far, far away from the region, uh, but it doesn't exist in other languages. So what we have done in this um, partnership, uh, it's to translate this course into French and then adapt it to uh, the Francophone context. And this has been done together with the partners. So first tr translation of the language by UNESCO and then a technical review and validation of the course um, by the Université Numérique, the French Digital University. And finally, the cultural validation within the Francophone OER group. Because you can imagine when you translate such a course, it's not only to translate the language, it's also to uh, contextualize the examples. It was even complicated explanations around uh, different types of law traditions that we had to take into account in this translation, the common versus civil law um, dichotomy, dichotomy uh, between these uh, different uh, historical um, law traditions in these different regions. And then we document this process. Um, because anyone could take this course and replicate and do the same in another language. So uh, this is the, the beauty of open and OER. Uh, you can build on something that's already done and you create uh, something new that gives a, a, a new value to new um, people. The second project is uh, the Encore Plus project. It's a completely different one, but it's still about OER. Uh, it's um, Erasmus Plus Knowledge Alliance project, co-funded by the European Commission, and ICD is the coordinator of this project. It's, we're doing it together with uh, many other partners who come from both education and the business side. And this is about um, trying to create um, an ecosystem of OER, it's very ambitious. Um, we are investigating um, innovation, the innovation and entrepreneurship potential within OER. And um, 
trying to explain this in very short time is very complicated, but I'll, I'll try. So in the outer circle, you have the challenges that we have uh, identified in this area. That even though we have many o OER uh, in many European countries, uh, there's, a, um, there's a low development of institutional strategies the G's within the educational institutions. There's a lack of a European quality paradigm. Um, there's a lack of interoperability among different repositories. So it's there can be difficult to find and search and reuse. So even though a lot of OER exists, still can be a challenge to, to really use them. So it's a fragmentation of this whole community. And, uh, and perhaps this innovation potential hasn't been taking to its fully advantage. So these challenges are challenges we're trying to address in the project through these circles, topical circles. So these are the four topical circles, circles that we are focusing on, policies and practice, quality, technology, and innovation and business model. So throughout this three-year project that started in January this year, we will connect um, interested parties to these circles and we will do that through events uh, that you can um, attend and we have several this fall uh, you see the dates we started actually today with um, the innovation and business model circle and we have several coming up um, the coming months and i'm thinking for you guys uh, coming from a business school, uh, we're really interested uh, to have you on board on this project. So if you're interested in this topic and want to learn more, feel free to join. It's completely open and free of charge. So I left a slide here with the contact information uh, from Juliana, my colleague, who is the project coordinator here. And in the bottom, you can see the, the partners, uh, the different partners uh, of, of this project together with ICDE. So I think uh, my time is pretty much up now. So just uh, closing with a couple of slides um, with links to ICD's newsletter, uh, social media, blog, and also our open scholarly journal, Open Praxis, which is completely open. And you can subscribe to that if you are interested in, in reading the latest research in the field. And here's my email. And um, I think I'll stop there. Um, so I don't know, we're taking the questions at the end, Anais, yes. uh, or if there's um, any immediate questions. Maybe, yes, there is already a few questions. Maybe, yeah, we can we can take one here directly to your presentation. And and then, because yeah, we still have, if it's okay with you, Jan Chetil, we, we, we take yours after your presentation. Okay, great. So uh, there is one question here in the chat. Of course, the Zoom meeting format is also for you to be able to interact directly with the speaker. So feel free to turn on your camera and ask your question directly. That's even even more uh, alive and uh, lively and and, uh, and interactive. So don't uh, feel obliged to to send uh, your questions in the chat. But there is a few now, so I can start with that one. Um, do you see a trend in terms of age range for people who want to access lifelong learning? Is it also more men or women? <laughs> Yeah, it's a difficult question, I, and it, I guess it depends on where you are on the globe. Um, but what we saw um, during the pandemic, for example, when many uh, universities closed down, we saw that the people who already were prevented from access to education were the ones who hurt the most. So women and girls, especially in developing countries, are the most vulnerable. Um, but when it comes to, uh, I mean, education, at least uh, as we see here in Norway, uh, we see that, you know, I mean, in girls are there when they're competing on the grades, there are really more and more girls and women um, in, uh, in the, uh, the directions of yeah, like all of them, like science and medicine and, and well, technology is still male dominated by all means, but uh, I think there is a trend uh, that, that, I mean, more and more women and girls are also seeking uh, education. Uh, but when it comes to lifelong learning, maybe Jan, Jan Tjettil uh, has more more details on that questions, maybe from, from Bia's uh, point of view, at least. Yeah. 
Shadil, do you have a, a comment or um, do you want to bounce back on, on this uh, specific question? I don't, I don't have a particular, uh, uh, what, I th what I think, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, I think ev actually everything is open because uh, uh, there, there are so many aspects of what we used to think of as schooling that, uh, that are I wouldn't call it dead, but the, the whole concept of education and learning is actually um, in, in uh, let's call it, it's in the melting pot somehow. So, um, so we will be surprised, I think, in the years to come. Okay, maybe we should um, make sure that Jan Tietl gets to you know, do his presentation and we can have more uh, questions at the end if we have time. So that's okay. I'll, I'll give the floor to you, Jan Tietl, and we, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm going to show a presentation that is, might be a slightly different from what you thought. And um, before I start out, I just wanted to hear the sound of some of the other participants. Now, I see, I noticed, for example, that um, a majority of the participants tonight have the, the given name Alex. There are at least three people who might be uh, addressed by the name of Alex. So Alex, will, will an Alex perhaps show his or her face? Is that a possibility? No, not are shy today. <laughs> there's there's not a single Alex in there. One thing, Agnes, I can see your face, and I can I, see I can. You. Sorry, it took me some Alex. time to find the buttons. I'm here. Let, let me turn on my camera here. Oh, that's nice. Sorry, it's coming up. Ah, here. There it is. Hi, Good everyone. <laughs> Hi, and a beautiful and friendly face with a smile on it. Thank you. <laughs> How <laughs> who would have thought that? <laughs> okay, but so that's why that's not bad actually. We have one of three. So 30% of the Alexes in the world are willing to show their face online. 33%. Um, how do you feel, Alex, about this uh, session? Yeah, fine. It's really nice to have one in English, first of all. So thank you all to have organized a conference in English. I'm really happy about that. Okay. Okay. So we're on the same team. I tried to open in French. It didn't, it didn't really work out. <laughs> um, but the other Alexes, they are not showing their face. There is a reason why I'm uh, asking. Yeah. Um, the other Alex is actually myself. It's me. Oh. It's because I have to, I have to go out. I have to go out, go out. I have to leave very soon. I really want to listen to the conference. So I uh, connect it through my phone. So I'm coming so that I make sure to just listen to, to the end. Ah, and now here is, here is actually what I think. I think that's actually a nice twist. And I, that's actually one of the, uh, I was hoping for a thing like that when I asked the question, because what you're doing is in some ways, what you could have said, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, let's say, breaking a social um, convention. Now we are here and I am showing my face and you're showing your face, which is kind of a sign of, you know, trust and vulnerability. And then you leave early, which, you know, some people excuse themselves for that. But then you say, but you could say, I've got your lecture in my pocket because I'm, I'm taking it with me on my phone or something else, right? So then you're saying, I'm having a gadget and I'm putting the meeting into my pocket. So even if I cannot be there with my face, I can travel around and I can still link up with what you will be saying. Now, this is actually what my, 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 uh, here my lecture is about. The idea that we are into, uh, we are actually into a landscape where social conventions are breaking up in terms of learning. And that's very unpleasant. So, for example, for me, when I'm sitting here and looking, um, I, I can do two things. Uh, either I can be very formal, I, could, I was thinking of wearing a tie and going through a very formal sort of presentation, and then probably not hitting any targets. Or I could just loosen up and ask, hoo hoo, Alex, are you out there? Would you like to communicate with me? Now, there are very few people in the room right now. So the question is, which approach can we use the technology to address? And I think, and that's my, that's my personal take on it, is that actually 
we can use the technology for getting in touch personally, which actually is a much more powerful learning experience than listening to a professor who is just holding his PowerPoint, I think. And then after you know showing your face and saying, hello, I'm, I'm sorry, but I got to leave early. And at least I know that you will be walking around with my voice in your pocket, which is kind of a comforting thought. What about you, Nadia? Are you out there? And then, and there Anna is saying that she's not putting a camera, she's handling dinner for her son. Actually, I think it's cool. And she even added, Nadia, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. Ah, what, will you share why you're not putting on, um, putting on your camera? Uh, no, I just wash my hair. <laughs> oh, it's a mess. Your hair is a mess. It couldn't be worse than mine. Yes, I'm, I just want it. So. I'm sure your hair couldn't be worse than mine. So, <laughs> so feel free. Uh, feel free. Actually, I will tell you something. I will reveal something about myself. And that mm -hmm. is, uh, I can talk to huge audiences. My, I make a living out of talking to huge audiences. The worst thing I know is talking to a black wall on Zoom. It takes... Uh -huh. It takes a tremendous toll on my self-confidence. And this is actually what I'm going to talk about, because um, what I think Turun has been talking about in the previous section is the amazing en enigma now that when all this knowledge, when all the information when all the teachers are out there almost or totally for free online, why will there still be schools? Okay. See, why will there still be schools? And the most obvious answer is, of course, we're used to having schools, we're used to having teachers, we're used to having conventions, and we're used to having diplomas. So Anna is, uh, Anna is while <laughs> preparing her son's dinner, she, she's agreeing with me, which I think is nice. Now, here's the thing. Everyone knows that if you're, if I'm holding a lecture in the classroom, most people are thinking about something else. At least I am thinking of something else when I'm attending other people's lectures. I'm just listening in and I'm sort of skipping the other things that I don't like to think about because I'm thinking about other things. Uh, but politely, we are, we are we're trying to look present and we're trying to look at the lecture and so we're following the social obligations. Mm -hmm. And why are we doing that? Well, the main reason we're doing that is actually that we are following a set of conventions and schools are full of conventions. When schools are full of conventions, that's actually what makes them very, and sometimes very, let's call them um, uh, attractive because saying that you have gone to a school and having a diploma is actually a good thing and nobody's going to ask you what, what came out of that? I'm not going now going to share my presentation, okay? So you'll understand what I'm talking about. This. Let me see. I was going to share my presentation. Um, and there it goes. And uh, let me see. I'm starting out here. Anais, you have to stop me talking when I've said too much, okay? You have like 15 minutes. Okay. So oh. here I am. <laughs> Uh, I'm the Dean of the BI Norwegian Business School and the, what I'm doing is I'm, have, I'm sort of being responsible for selling executive education to somewhere around 7,000 people every year. It's quite a big school actually, 7,000 people. And most of them want to come to campus. And we are of course making a living out of that. So we think it's good idea for business. But what I think is that the business is suboptimal. So what's happening? Well, before the pandemic, even, I had the BI, the school's record in, in lecturing from a high place. I actually held a lecture in what you could call digital leadership from a flight 38,000 feet above Siberia. The students are everywhere else. It was before the pandemic and I was totally legally on the flight, no quarantines, no nothing. And the students were everywhere else which they thought was weird. Just a year later, we had the opposite problem. We couldn't be anywhere else but online. 
And so I had to make what you see there to the right is actually with some students testifying that I was able to make them feel that a course in leadership development was actually spiritual cleansing. I didn't invent the expression. What I'm trying to say here is the possibility of acquiring presence of students and a teacher is the possibility to serve the knowledge that you need where you need it, when you need it, even when you're preparing your son's dinner. Or if you think that your hair is looking out of style, or if you're on the run and you've got to, you know, got to be somewhere else. So what I'm trying to take you into here is the slight mystery now that knowledge is accessible and you can have it almost everywhere. That's why I started with showing you the picture where I was actually lecturing in, 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 in Norway from the plane in Siberia. Just to give you an idea of how immense this um, information and uh, knowledge over, you know, what you could call it, it's, it's a deluge of, of knowledge. This is the number of publications, scientific studies in leadership. I am a professor in leadership. When in 2004, when I submitted my doctoral thesis, there were in total 20,000 scientific publications in leadership on the face of the earth. Since 1945 until you know 60 years later, we produced over 60 years 20,000 articles. Now we're producing. 20,000 articles per year. It's an exponential increase in nonsense. I can't help saying that. I'm not entirely agreeing that it's nonsense, but what I'm just saying is that the knowledge universe is expanding and it's expanding much quicker, not in the amount of knowledge it creates, but in the amount of people that are being sucked up into this industry. Because this huge expansion in management and other types of topics isn't because we are discovering so much more. No, it is because we are enrolling all over the globe so many more people into this business called education and research and knowledge generation. There are actually so many of the, involved in this worldwide that the schools are bursting in the seams. And so what is happening now these days is, of course, this weird situation where on the one hand, the schools and the research communities and the governments are pushing out initiatives like Tudums to you know, present knowledge all over the world, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. On the other side, you will find schools probably also like mine, that are trying to protect their brands and trying to protect their diplomas by clinging on to the idea that we have something special that you will not have if you take this on a digital platform without connecting to anyone. So what we are talking about is for this knowledge, for this enormous flood of knowledge to reach to all over you, we need to be able to use the technologies to reach out and create a social environment. This is just to show you that the signals, of course, as you probably know, have been picked up. This is a financial time survey and what employers want. And what you can see is that the businesses have understood that it's expensive and quite tedious to send people off to courses, but we will always have to learn. I think basically we are getting outdated all the time. The, the time when we used to have to go to school in the beginning, that, that life is over. Me, I'm now over 60 years old. I have a doctoral degree. I'm learning so many new things, and I would call it on a high school level. There's nothing doctoral about my a lot of the things that I'm learning, for example, now in I'm, I'm doing research using algorithms. And I think I know uh, my learning capabilities when it comes to programming languages and algorithms are not as good as my son's, who is actually 18. So 
what I'm, what I'm saying here is we are always learning all the time. And most of the businesses understand that. And they also understand that it is possible to learn a lot of stuff without necessarily being in the school all the time. So what am I saying from the business point of view? Well, the textbook is dying. Uh, I'm writing books. I'm not getting rich on those, I can tell you. What I want to do is actually I would want to make uh, interactive movies because that's so much more fun and so, so much more interesting, but nobody knows who's going to pay for them. But the textbook is dying, I show you. The classroom is dying. Uh, the classroom, I, we've got a lot of executive students writing back to us now. They're actually writing on what they learned from the pandemic. And what they learn is that it, they are missing meeting the other students, but they're not missing listening to teachers who make boring speeches. They don't miss that. They say, well, you we can do that in other ways. We don't have to come to listen to you lecturing to us. We have to do different things if we meet. So the classroom is a dying place. But still everyone, the students and the faculty and the governments have been to school and they know what education should be. And that, what I think is happening is basically we're locked into some sorts of types of conventions, partly financial, partly, partly they're legal and regulatory, but also partly because this is governed by old people like me. During the pandemic, I heard a lot of teachers who said, I have to, just a second. Uh, Alex ran away. Um, Abdallah, are you out there? I'm still here. <laughs> ah, you're still here, Alex. Abdallah is there. Abdallah is on the subway. How? That's cool. That's, I love that. <laughs> That's cool. So, Pierre, are you there? Maybe not. Maybe he's there. I don't know. But here's the thing. I, I love seeing your faces and your responses. And he is, Agnes is, is testifying to the fact that Pierre is not a fantasy, he is there. Now, so, so the thing is, in the beginning, the, the teachers were telling me that the students disappeared from, uh, from the screens. They didn't see them. They found it was very difficult to see them. And so they said the students went away. And I, asked my son about that and said, oh, do the students go away? And my son, who was having parties and classes and doing things simultaneously into two o'clock in the night said, no, it isn't the students who disappear. He said, it's actually the teachers that are coming too late into the digital classroom because they are like me, I am now, they are trying to do digitally what they are doing in the physical classroom. But the kids are online all the time. They don't have a problem with that. They didn't disappear. It's the teachers who come too late and the headmasters probably. So what I'm trying to say, and this is my, maybe that's my main message tonight, is that expectation management, what I'm trying to do now, it's necessary to create new and formalized learning venues. I'm sure that learning new things is a little bit like going to the gym. It's easier if you have a coach. It's easier if you have a teacher. And it's certainly easier if you have a group of friends who will help you go there also when you're not motivated. So learning is in many ways a very, very social thing. But learning is also a, a, a formalized, hard and unpleasant thing to take part in, which means that pe people might not get engaged in it unless you can do it on the subway when you're preparing your son's dinner or you have to go to a meeting. You see, my, my point is the information and the stuff need to be brought to you, but in a way that is compatible with our expectations of what true learning could actually be. So uh, you could say, I just need to move. Uh, the opportunities are actually everywhere. And I think that was true and has been talking about. We've never had so many opportunities to reach people with the knowledge that they need, where they are, when they need it. And space and time are now beyond our constraints. We, we can bend them. I mean, we can, we can, I'm teaching in China. I'll go, you're going to show you some pictures. We can teach in China. Uh, we, I can leave my stuff here and you can look it up afterwards when you left and so on. So we can actually bend space and time, which is fantastic, I think. 
But the problems are we don't really understand learning. We're bound by, by um, old habits. We don't really understand much of the technologies that are growing up. There are lots of stuff happening all the time. But maybe worse, the social construction of reality is something that we need to attend to. The social and the formal control. Because all societies control the value of knowledge, not by how useful it is, but it controls the knowledge for showing which club you were a member of. And so I'm, I'm sorry to say, folks, I know that this is Neoma's uh, network gathering, and I'm from a different school, but I want you to tell you some of the secrets behind the big executive MBA programs. The secret is you have to attract the right people. Then the program does nothing with them, and then they are still the right people when they emerge out of the program. The point is, the idea is, if you want to have a splendid program, you will, re you will recruit people who are already splendid because they belong to some sort of an elite. That increases the likelihood that everybody is still part of the elite when they graduate from that program. It's really hard to actually show that the knowledge that is being um, passed over in these programs differs. No, as far as I know, nobody has been able to show that the quality of knowledge is different in many ways as the way that, or at least not that the knowledge differs in the way that the price of the diplomas differ. And that is the problem today, that lifelong learning accessible at any point is there, but it's really, really hard to get a stamp on it and say, well, I really, I really took a degree in this, or I really got a course in this and open up the door. I'll get, if you give me a job, I'll show you what I can use it for. That's hard. So it means that we need, in order to have a you know, viable lifelong learning, we need to co-create communities of practice. And that's the biggest issue. And I think Tudun, what Tudun showed us now is a, at the beginning is a piece of that. Now, here is to me the reason why most people don't like online learning. This is my classroom. You see, this isn't really, really inspiring. Can you see, when I'm teaching in China and I'm teaching in China a couple of times a year, and then I go into this room and I spend four whole days in that room. And that's what I'm trying to turn myself into. I'm trying to turn myself into somebody who can engage through cyberspace in a way that makes the student feel that they don't, that they want to do this. I'll tell you, Chinese students are some of the most, uh, I would say, picky students in the world when it comes to online teaching. And that is because they have so many cheap programs in China online. The students that take our program pay through their nose for that program. So when they understood that they had to start doing things online, they got really angry. They wanted the money back. And lots of other, other students said, we want our money back because we don't want to do this online. And what I try to say is, come on, people, what are you afraid of? What you're afraid of is probably that you don't meet, right? So what you are afraid of is being sucked up by a machine like this one. OK, I'm going to show you that you can do some magic. Basically, what the, what the companies want out there, they don't they don't really want people who know all these, uh, let's call it the technical qualities of learning. That's fine, but that's taken for granted. That the learning, at least in management, that people want is to, that the, the, the people, the recipients of the knowledge should be able to use it in the way that they address other people. And the online format, the, the digital format is so plastic. It feels so unengaging. And I only have these few minutes, uh, but the reason I started out that I'm, the way I was doing is to say, come on, I can send you a lot of documents. I can send you my PPT on, online. I can just pass it on. I can put it on autoplay. The problem is to actually go back and create some sort of interaction. Pierre, <laughs> is that what you're looking like? That's very nice, very nice of you to show up your face. 
I love yeah, that. I'm, I'm very sorry, but we, we're actually reaching the end of the session. And if yeah. we want actually to interact with the participants, there is already one question, for instance, in the chat. Maybe okay. so if you, you want, want to, to stop me at this very, point? Well, or conclude, maybe kind of. Maybe up. I can conclude. <laughs> okay, I'll give. I'll conclude by one final point, and let me see. Uh, let me see where, where I wanted to conclude. Um, uh, it wasn't this one. Let me see. Uh, yeah. Well, here it is. My point is, this is the, these are my feet, actually. You don't see it on, on, uh, online, but th these are actually my feet. And this is on the evening before I had that course in China. And what I'm thinking is, I really hated not being able to go to China. But on the other hand, it is fantastic to be able to sit like this and think this, this is actually a course in leadership. And here comes the point. I chose this, the tune, Staying Alive. I made sure we played it on every break. I, I sent it back to, through the Chinese channels. And then I started the class by having the video on my, my motorbike screen. So this is actually me starting the class on the motorbike on my way to the classroom. And I have one intention with all of this. You could call it sort of clown-like behaviors and that I'm doing now. And that is, we have to break loose from the confinements of the classroom, not of the 20th century, but also almost from the 19th century, because knowledge has been wrapped in formats that are almost impossible to use nowadays. And to me, the, the, the business part of this is knowledge is now actually accessible when you need it, where you need it. But all we lack is the stamp of, let's call it, the authorizing agency. Yes, you took a course, but you did it while preparing your son's dinner. Yes, you took a course, but while you were on the beach. Yes, and so on. You see what I mean? But, you know, this, and you took a course, but you did it while you are on, maybe in an airport lounge or something. I don't know. Anyhow, I'm going to finish there, people. But this is to me business, you know, addressing knowledge when you need it, where you need it, no matter the format. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you both for your uh, very interesting presentations and uh, the, the, um, the topic, the, the questions that you raised. I think we could spend hours talking about, uh, about the challenges, about the philosophy behind the lifelong learning, behind open education. Uh, I don't know, Elodie, and yes, if we have a few seconds just to have an interaction on questions or if we have to close now it's already nine so i don't know maybe one question if uh, because alex uh, pierre abdallah nadia and hannah are still uh, there but i have one question for you is it as effective as before as we were in a classroom because uh, when I am on a motorbike, I'm not sure I'm very really focused on a, a, a teacher. I, I think, I think it, it matters, but we are, what you have to split up in this are the learning elements, because there are various things that you have to attend to. So one is the social interaction among the students where the teacher is basically really unnecessary. So you need to guard that. The other point is, yes, of course, you can insert the knowledge. I, when, whenever the Chinese ask me, is this effective? Then I start speaking Chinese. And I have to say, the reason my French is ruined is that learning Chinese comes on top of my, my French. So I can't speak French any longer, but I can speak Chinese pretty good. The Chinese, my Chinese is learned completely on my motorbike with plugs in my ear uh, on digital, through digital measures. And I sp ask them, do you think this is fake? And they say, no. Come on. You can choose your learning environment. I can never do that at school. There was one question in the chat too. Um, do you think that digital learning is lacking practicing, especially helping bridge between school and business? I think, I think we uh, digital learning is not one thing. That, so I think, uh, yes, in the long run, the digital learning arenas will be adapted to any purpose. And if it proves to be ineffective, then we can always make it more effective. The, the threat to our schools is that the businesses can now really start asking, is it going to make a change? 
And then they can choose the provider that really is going to make a change. And I say, we have to come after that. We, we have to be there. But that's why I'm saying the classroom. The classroom is dying. It's not dead, but it's dying. Well, thank you so much. I think we, we, we have to close now. But, uh, welcome for the debate. Uh, we can continue. Um, please uh, contact. Uh, well, I forgot to present myself. I have the little ICD logo here also. So I'm also a senior advisor at ICD and uh, uh, Preparatory Conseil uh, College, the promotion in 2006 of uh, uh, Neoma Business School, who was then uh, Reims, uh, uh, Ecole Supérieure de Commerce. But uh, please take contact with uh, ICD at ICD.org. Uh, welcome, uh, join the community also, as Torin um, showed you at the end of our PowerPoint. And welcome to the Norwegian network of Neoma alumni. And uh, generally, the Neoma alumni network. Uh, um for all of you and thank you for your attention and your uh, participation tonight thank you again to the speakers that uh, joined us tonight for very interesting presentations <laughs>